just heard this incredible noise of hyenas. Obviously, there was something afoot. It is Farai, alive but bone thin, weak, and facing a vicious mob. Life as a nomad had obviously taken its toll, and we couldn't believe how bad Farai was looking. It was just incredible to see a lion in such poor condition. I mean, all signs of his mane had disappeared, and he was just an extremely thin and desperate lion. Farai is engaged in a fight for his life, and then comes the cavalry. He's formed a coalition with another nomadic male, one who is also in terrible condition, but his presence is enough to turn the tide. After a brief but desperate battle, the lions drive off the hyenas, and then exact a grisly revenge. In the aftermath, Farai has taken a hyena cub. Hyenas are relatively slow breeders, and the death of a single cub can be an enormous loss. Farai seems almost too weak and exhausted to eat the cub. It's most unusual for a lion to eat a hyena, but Farai was obviously really desperate and starving. Still, the Richardsons hold out some hope for the young lion. Given the fact that he'd survived through most of the dry season and he had formed a coalition with another male, he'd obviously hung in this long and we just hoped that he'd manage to hang in a bit longer. There is thunder in the valley. Here, great herds of buffalo make their way through a parched African landscape, responding to the siren call of water. Sweet and clear, a spring rises out of an otherwise dry riverbed, a rare oasis. It is also a trap. To get there, the animals must descend into a valley of death. Filmmakers Lynn and Phil Richardson have come to this unique place in the hopes of capturing the secret life of the magnificent predators who prey upon these herds. We went on an expedition in the Zambezi Valley and during this trip we found this spring which we realized would be perfect for lions. It's quite a big spring in an area which is very hot and very dry. So the large herds of buffalo, they have to go there to drink. The Zambezi Valley, broad and deep, carves its way through the ancient landscape of northern Zimbabwe. The spring lies 30 miles from the Zambezi River. The gorge around the spring is a dream landscape for predators, but it can be a nightmare for filmmaking. Thick scrub and countless gullies render vehicles useless. Making a film about lions on foot is something that hasn't been done before. We thought long and hard about walking with lions. At first it was really scary, but after a while it was extremely invigorating. But walking with lions means lugging camera equipment over difficult terrain, in heat that can reach 115 degrees. With trackers Vice and Chris, Lynn follows a fresh trail. This is fresh now. Fresh. What time? Yeah, this is uh, six o'clock. Okay, this is the one we must stay on now, yeah, Vice. Okay, let's follow this one. The lions have gotten used to the filmmakers and usually ignore them, but today, for some reason, they are not welcome. 
When a lion charges you, it's the most terrifying feeling, as if your heart has dropped out of your body. At times, I thought, well, this is it, and it's coming too close, what do I do? But thank goodness our trackers taught us not to move and that was our saving grace. Sorry, Shumba. Very sorry. I think speaking to them very gently and quietly makes them relax. I'm certain of that. At first, Lynn assumes that they have stumbled upon sleeping lions. They're all sleeping here. That's a pity. We disturbed them. No, he's coming back. It's great. OK, Shumba. But then the reason for the lion's aggression becomes clear. Vice is the first to realize what's wrong. There's more one. That's why they are so. That's why they're so nervous because they've got cubs in there. Yes. It's their first glimpse of a cub they'll call Shumba, a cub who will become an important part of their lives over the next four years. The lions seem to be headed for the spring. Phil, Phil, come in. Okay, Phil, we are between elbow and fig tree. Lynn radios Phil so that he can get there before them and into his hide. The cub belongs to a lioness dubbed Mrs. Hunter. Phil hurries to get into position. A zoologist as well as a filmmaker, he is eager to get a glimpse of the newest member of the Pride. He and Lynn have set up permanent hides at the best vantage points for observing the spring and the entrances to the gorge. Shooting from the hides has allowed the Richardsons to get to know each of the Pride members as individuals. Kavingo, the dominant pride male, is the first to arrive. Nine adult and sub-adult females follow. Kavingo is the territorial male. He's actually a wonderful lion. He just has a superb confidence about him. And what's best is that he's relaxed with us and accepts us. Mrs. Hunter is the killer in the pride. She's very experienced. But she's also a fantastic and very gentle mother. Her cub Shumba was so confident and full of life, we knew from the outset that she was to be a very special lion. And then there's Farai, Shumba's six-month-old cousin and the comedian of the pride. Farai is a lion cub without a care in the world. He thinks this whole place is just made for him and all the lions are his playmates. He's just an indomitable little fella. Another lioness calls for her own cubs, just two weeks older than Shumba. Lionesses in a pride tend to synchronize their breeding and share child-rearing duties, even suckling each other's babies. But there's no time to tarry at the spring. It's been three days since the lions have eaten. And if the lionesses are to continue to produce milk, they must hunt. It's time to stash the cubs, and the lionesses have already picked out a perfect shelter, a tiny cave not far from the spring. While the cubs settle into their snug hideaway, the hungry adults head out. Farai, too young to hunt and too old to huddle in the cave, looks bereft at being left behind. 
At the height of the dry season, several herds of buffalo come to drink at the spring every day. The buffalo must be aware that lions haunt this place, but thirst leaves them no choice. The lions take up ambush positions at the entrances to the spring. mother shows exactly how she earned her name. <laughs> Deftly, she hangs on to the thrashing one-ton animal, keeping out of reach of sharp hooves and horns. Finally, the rest of the pride arrives. It will take the combined weight and strength of all the lions to finish the buffalo off. Within minutes, the scavengers have settled in to observe the kill. As have the filmmakers. They don't make a kill every day, and so when they do eat, they make the most of it. And they really gorge themselves and can eat 40 pounds of meat at a sitting. Spotted hyenas join the vultures waiting for a place at the banquet. The lions are so full that their attempts to drive off the hyenas, their ancient enemies, are half-hearted at best. Now it's time for a good lie down, something lions excel at. They'll spend up to 20 hours a day resting, conserving their energy. But for the Richardsons, there's no time to nap. Back at camp, they have to prepare for a long night of filming. Can you pick up the lipstick? As dusk settles over the camp, some noisy neighbors roost in the trees above. For Phil and Lynn, the baboons are not just amusing. The baboons are quite helpful in a way. They're extremely vigilant. So when they're in camp, they act as a sort of security system for us and sound their alarm if a lion or leopard is approaching camp. nightfall, Phil and Lynn head for their hides. It took us a while to get used to walking in the bush at night. It's pitch black, full of sounds of animals, and you never know what is around you. Near the hide, Phil directs infrared lights toward the spring. We can't use regular lights, or the lions will leave. So we use infrared light, which the lions can't see but neither can we. So we're blind except for what's visible through our infrared camera. When you switch on the lights, there's absolutely no change in the animal behavior at all. You to keep your wits about you because all you can see is what you see in your monitor. Tonight the pride is feeding on yet another buffalo carcass. affair with as much snarling as eating going on and their dinner is about to be interrupted
Elephants prefer to visit the spring by night, but they do not appreciate the company of lions. Protective cows crowd around their babies. The giant adults have little to fear from lions, but the big cats are the main predators of young elephant calves, and an ancient antagonism exists between the two species. A psychological duel ensues. The elephants seem infuriated by the proximity of the lions. retreat. The elephants appear to treat the buffalo carcass with a mixture of curiosity and fear. As if to deny their defeat, Farai, Mrs. Hunter, and Kavingo noisily announce that they are still the rightful kings of beasts. The adults in the pride are extremely tolerant of Farai. They put up with his antics with little more than a snarl or two. Now the ravenous cubs appear and suckle furiously. Even Farai, now old enough to be weaned, steals a suckle. Eventually, the females decide that enough is enough. Now, everyone is full and sleepy. rumble of thunder interrupts the lion's reverie. This calm, balmy night is about to take a violent turn. Humidity blown in from the north heralds the end of the long, hot, dry season. It's time to get Shumba and her cousins into the den. The filmmakers, too, head for cover, hoping that they won't blunder into elephants or lions in the rumbling darkness. By morning, rain is falling steadily. The wet season is officially here. This is good news for the wild things in the area, but not for the film crew. With water available everywhere, the great herds will no longer need to come to the spring, and the lions will head out after them. Filming will have to be suspended. When the rains come at the end of the dry season, the place transforms immediately. One day you'll have hundreds of animals coming to the spring, and the next it'll be totally deserted. We just didn't realize for how long it would be deserted. When the weather came and we experienced the worst floods in living memory, our project was failing, and we had to face that, and there was nothing we could do. The Richardsons have little to film for almost a year and a half, aside from occasional sightings of the pride. Having hung in, we managed to see the pride from time to time. We caught glimpses of Farai and Shumba and they all seemed to be flourishing.
Finally, after 18 months of mostly lost filming, the weather turns and the landscape begins to dry out again. Anxiously, Phil and Lynn await the return of the pride. Then one day they spot a familiar figure at the bottom of the gorge. It is Mrs. Hunter on a buffalo kill. After so much time, the filmmakers have no idea if the lions will remember them or if they'll be starting from scratch. We were very pleasantly surprised. She was actually amazingly tolerant, given the fact that we hadn't been this close to her for over 18 months. It was just so good to see the lions back again and to be on foot with them again. That feeling of being alive reawakened in us. You feel so at one with the lions and with what you're trying to achieve. It was really fantastic. The filmmakers are delighted to see another lioness approach the kill. It's Shumba, now fully grown. But the lions have already gorged and abandoned the carcass after a few more mouthfuls. Instantly, the vultures seize the opening. Shumba is not pleased, and with good reason. A vulture can consume two pounds of flesh in minutes. She rushes the scavengers, only to be frightened off by the flap of wings. Kavingo, the male, is beginning to show his age. He was still a big, powerful lion, but you could see that age was creeping up on him. So we were worried that his time as Lord of the Spring must be up. And there is trouble in the air. Kavingo has smelled the telltale signs of two young males wandering through his territory. They are after his lionesses. And today the nomads have decided to stake their claim. Young males are in their prime. Shumba and Farai sensing trouble head for cover. Kavingo has a choice to make, stand his ground or leave. The new males insolently sent Mark over Kavingo's marks and the older lionesses seem intrigued. <laughs> Like most young males, these two were expelled from their birth prides at about Farai's age and have wandered after the herds ever since. But now they have their eyes on Kavingo's lionesses and his bountiful place at the spring. Kavingo, outnumbered, is still reluctant to give up his territory. But one of the new males takes the offensive. The battle is brief but decisive. The lionesses look on as Kavingo departs. Bereft of his females and his prime real estate, the old male heads into the wilderness. The victor watches him go. We knew Kavinga couldn't last forever, but it was actually a very sad time for us. We knew him so well and we liked him. I was really sad to see Kavinga go. Not only because we knew we'd never see him again, but because we got so attached to him. He was a very composed lion and very patient with his cubs. It was really sad to see him leave.
The arrival of the two new males seems to have unnerved the pride. Young Shumba and Farai take to the trees in terror. Farai's approaching the age when young males are driven from the pride. With tolerant Kavingo gone, his situation is precarious. Filmmakers are unnerved as well. These lions came from nowhere. We'd never seen them before. They'd probably not laid their eyes on humans before. They kept running away when we went close to them. Hoping the lions will come to them, Phil and Lynn set up in a hide near the pride's favorite place to drink. They don't have to wait long. It's the larger of the new males, loudly roaring his claim to this territory. We had often videoed Kavinga at night, but now we had no idea how the two new males would react to us. The adult lionesses seem to have accepted their new leader. The male has not accepted the presence of humans. They're huge, powerful animals, and those growls and roars just rattle through your body. It's really scary at night. At night, they are just so completely in their own element, and you so completely out of your element, and their respect for you diminishes to a very thin line. When the lions disappear from the monitor, Phil scans the landscape, worried the cats might be stalking them from behind. He resorts to a searchlight. To his relief, he sees the lions heading off into the night. The dry season is deepening. Usually, the last water in the riverbed evaporates, leaving the spring as the only surface water for miles around. Life becomes ever more desperate for the wildlife. A few miles from the spring, elephants gather in the withering heat, which now soars over 100 degrees. The riverbed looks dry, but the elephants are about to transform it. There are a few places where water level underground seems to rise up, and they dig wells to get down to the water. It is a great opportunity for the filmmakers, and a great risk. It's a lot more dangerous than working with lions on foot, because the mothers are so protective over their babies. Using their enormous bulk and strength, the elephants dig down to the water level to create mud wallows. The mud cools them and protects their hides from parasites. For the youngsters, wallowing is just plain fun. Baboons are happy to help themselves to the fruits of the elephant's labors. It's dangerous for baboon babies to wander. New males in the troop might kill them. Fortunately, these babies come equipped with restraining devices. Phil notices that the wind is beginning to turn. Lynn heads for safety, but Phil stays behind to capture a few more close-ups. The elephants had been aware of me for quite a while, and so I was feeling quite confident. Then all of a sudden, she just got her bee in her bonnet and came for me. Phil takes cover, leaving the camera running. It was a pretty full-on charge, because she stopped only four feet from the camera.
When the lion charges you, there's no question. You have to stand your ground. On the other hand, if an elephant is charging you, you definitely have to clear out of there. After the elephants depart, the pride makes its way to the dry riverbed to rest. The new males and the older lionesses have accepted each other, for the most part. But Farai, Shumba and the other youngsters are still keeping their distance. Their lives may yet be in danger from the new males. Shumba is the first to hear intriguing sounds from above the gorge. It's a large herd of buffalo, at least 200 strong. Sheer size and numbers of the herd take the young lions by surprise. Shumba manages to spook one cow. Poor Farai manages to spook only himself, and the buffalo press their advantage. Buffalo are strange. Sometimes they run, sometimes they charge. The buffalo probably saw these lions were particularly lacking in confidence and took the opportunity to chase them around. Probably made the buffalo feel good. The young lions slink off in ignominious defeat. One of the new males is watching Farai closely. He's not likely to tolerate the young male much longer. Shumba seems oblivious to her cousin's predicament and sticks by him constantly. Sensing the new male's growing aggression, Farai heads off to take up the life of a nomad. We'd really grown to like him a lot. And it was sad to see him being eased out by these two big guys, because we knew that what lay ahead of him was a pretty tough time. Shumba calls after him in vain. It is now the peak of another dry season. Water holes across this parched land have vanished. Some grazers are starving. And some have not made it. The dead elephant has left behind an orphan. Just a year old, it cannot yet fend for itself, and it's vulnerable to predators. If it is not adopted, it has no chance. Elephants do sometimes adopt orphans, but this one seems to be having no luck it may be the stress of the season, the battle for scarce resources, that causes the herd to reject the baby. Filming that little baby being rejected was so hard. I just thought, this is tough. Nature is so cruel at times. But it was really very sad to see that female push it away, and then it just went off on its own because it kind of got the message. And that was even harder because there was this tiny little thing that wasn't going to have much of a chance out on its own.
one night, the infrared light illuminates a group of elephants who have come to the spring and appear to be acting strangely. They seem both attracted and repelled by something. After searching through their monitors, the Richardsons discover the cause. It's the baby elephant, now dead. After having followed the baby Ellie for days and nights, we were amazed to see the other elephants pay their respects. It was very touching. It's difficult to know why they do it. Maybe it's just curiosity. Maybe there is some sort of feeling of loss within the elephants that they feel one of their number has gone. But there's no room for sentiment in nature. These are just the harsh realities of life at the spring. Before long, the lion pride has descended on the remains of the baby elephant. The size of the carcass brings together the entire pride for the first time since the arrival of the new males. The meal becomes a snarling, snappish affair. More elephants arrive and apparently object to the lions feeding on the baby elephant. In the end, it's a standoff. Another scorching morning dawns. The baboon sentries take up their lookout posts in the trees as hundreds of impala descend into the gorge. It is morning rush hour at the spring. In anticipation of a hunt, Lynn has taken up a position in a hide. Trackers Vice and Chris scan the scene from a tree above the gorge, keeping Lynn informed as to where the pride is heading. They're on the move. Lynn is anxious to see if Shumba has gained confidence after her brush with the buffalo. Everything was perfect. The gorge was filled with impala, desperate to drink. Shimba was moving into a perfect position. And the rest of the pride had closed off all the entrances to the spring. I watched intensely and felt really excited to see her so engaged. Shumba seems unable to decide which antelope to charge and lopes after them indiscriminately. Then she spots a straggler. Lost her in the vegetation, but we quickly moved to find she had made a kill. Shumba has finally come of age as a hunter.
she has apparently come of age in another way. She no longer avoids the males. In fact, she seems quite taken by them. Both males have noticed her condition, but two males and one female in heat can be a powder keg. Having asserted his dominance over his companion, the darker-maned male will shadow Shumba closely, reveling in her chemical invitations. By nightfall, Shumba is in an amorous mood, and so is the dark-maned male. Their courtship will last about three days and nights, punctuated by mating about every 20 minutes. Afterward, the two roar in chorus. The other male responds, and his roars will not go unanswered. Having reprimanded his companion, the male returns to court Shumba once again. later, strange wails and laughter pierce the gathering dusk. I just heard this incredible noise. Hyenas. Obviously there was something afoot. It is Farai, alive but bone thin, weak and facing a vicious mob. Life as a nomad had obviously taken its toll and we couldn't believe how bad Farai was looking. It was just incredible to see a lion in such poor condition, when all signs of his mane had disappeared, and he was just an extremely thin and desperate lion. Farai is engaged in a fight for his life, and then comes the cavalry. He's formed a coalition with another nomadic male, one who is also in terrible condition, but his presence is enough to turn the tide. <laughs> After a brief but desperate battle, the lions drive off the hyenas and then exact a grisly revenge. In the aftermath, Farai has taken a hyena cub. Hyenas are relatively slow breeders, and the death of a single cub can be an enormous loss. Farai seems almost too weak and exhausted to eat the cub. It's most unusual for a lion to eat a hyena, but Farai was obviously really desperate and starving. Still, the Richardsons hold out some hope for the young lion. Given the fact that he'd survived through most of the dry season and he had formed a coalition with another male, he'd obviously hung in this long and we just hoped that he'd manage to hang in a bit longer.
The next morning, Phil and trackers Chris Cross and Mike head out in the already soaring temperatures, strategizing where best to capture a hunt on film. If we go down, if we go down, too bad, bad, a bad, really bad, bad. Go down to the water. Some of the pride watches them pass by. A few yards further on, warning grumbles emanate from a thicket. It's the dark-maned male. He is still not fully habituated to the filmmakers. But soon the lions have lost interest in them. Something more pressing has their attention. Oh, there she is. Shumba is beginning to show her mother's intensity when it comes to stalking. of the gorge, the nervous buffalo paws, perhaps sensing a trap. The thirst overcomes caution, and the buffalo take the plunge. Each step closer to the water takes them closer to the big cats. Being in a perfect position, the buff stopped to drink right in front of me. Shumba was making her approach from where I could see her, and the atmosphere was really tense and quite scary. begins her stalk. The buffalo smell the lioness and spook, but after stampeding down the gorge a bit, they halt, unsure of where the danger lies. This time, it appears Shumba will not be intimidated. from the young lioness. But for one buffalo, it's too late. Shumba and Mrs. Hunter have caught it. Once the buffalo has been caught and brought to a standstill, they seem to almost go into a state of stupor. Maybe this is brought about by the lions hamstringing them and biting the nerves at the base of the tail. He's sort of held in one position. Once he's on the ground, he's got no chance. It will take the pride 20 minutes to kill the enormous beast. Shumba has truly proved to be Mrs. Hunter's daughter, fearless at the kill. In the ensuing few weeks, it becomes clear that Shumba is up to something. The lions often used to lie up in the dry riverbed, but we noticed that Shumba was always there, and quite often on her own. So we suspected that 
she wasn't just lying up for comfort, but that something else was cooking. Crisscross and Mike keep an eye on Shumba, waiting for her to head out on a hunting excursion. Only then can they safely send in the filmmakers to find out exactly what's been keeping Shumba so preoccupied. Cameras in hand, Lynn and Phil head for the spot that Shumba has been visiting. There, in a thicket that seems inadequate to protect something so precious, they find themselves in Shumba's den. It's just incredibly exciting to go in there knowing the danger of the situation. And then, of course, to be in a lion's den. I mean, you've heard stories there for 2,000 years. And there they were, just, just so fantastic to see these tiny little bundles and they were probably only three weeks old and their eyes had only just opened. They were really sweet. I thought they'd cuddle together miles apart. Oh, they can barely walk these little things. Just confirm he's still with the lioness, over. Phil radios the trackers to find that time is short. Shumba is heading back to her den. Phil hustles to get a small lipstick camera in place so that he and Lynn can monitor the den remotely and maybe catch the mother and cubs together. Okay, let's see what's clear out here. The lipstick's ready. Then it's time to go. Fifty yards downwind from the den, Phil keeps an eye on the cubs, awaiting Shumba's arrival. is in the den. She seemed so proud when she came back and we watched her through the remote camera for quite a few weeks and she was fantastic with the cubs. She was so gentle and we, we thought she was to be a good mommy. It's been the perfect ending to the Richardsons' time walking with lions. After four difficult years, they've captured the most intimate moments of an entire generation of lions on film. On the horizon, storm clouds have begun to gather. The rainy season cannot be far off. And soon the lions of the spring will depart, carrying with them the affections and hopes of the filmmakers who have come to know them so well. Some grazers are starving, and some have not made it. The dead elephant has left behind an orphan. Just a year old, it cannot yet fend for itself, and it's vulnerable to predators. If it is not adopted, it has no chance. Elephants do sometimes adopt orphans, but this one seems to be having no luck. It may be the stress of the season, the battle for scarce resources, that causes the herd to reject the baby. Filming that little baby being rejected was so hard. I just thought, this is tough. Nature is so cruel at times. But it was really very sad to see that female push it away and then it just went off on its own because it kind of got the message. And that was even harder because there was this tiny little thing that wasn't going to have much of a chance out on its own.
it is a great opportunity for the filmmakers and a great risk. It's a lot more dangerous than working with lions on foot because the mothers are so protective over their babies. Using their enormous bulk and strength, the elephants dig down to the water level to create mud wallows. The mud cools them and protects their hides from parasites. For the youngsters, wallowing is just plain fun. Baboons are happy to help themselves to the fruits of the elephant's labors. It's dangerous for baboon babies to wander. New males in the troop might kill them. Fortunately, these babies come equipped with restraining devices. Phil notices that the wind is beginning to turn. Lynn heads for safety, but Phil stays behind to capture a few more close-ups. The elephants had been aware of me for quite a while, and so I was feeling quite confident. Then all of a sudden, she just got her bee in her bonnet and came for me. Phil takes cover, leaving the camera running. There, in a thicket that seems inadequate to protect something so precious, they find themselves in Shumba's den. It's just incredibly exciting to go in there knowing the danger of the situation. And then, of course, to be in a lion's den. I mean, you've heard stories there for 2,000 years. And there they were, just, just so fantastic to see these tiny little bundles, and they were probably only three weeks old, and their eyes had only just opened. They were really sweet. It's not that cuddle together, they miles apart. Yeah, they can barely walk these little things. Uh, Chris confirm he's still with the lioness, over. Phil radios the trackers to find the time is short. Shumba is heading back to her den. Phil hustles to get a small lipstick camera in place so that he and Lynn can monitor the den remotely and maybe catch the mother and cubs together. Can I see this clear out here? The lipstick's ready. Then it's time to go. Fifty yards downwind from the line, Farai is engaged in a fight for his life. And then comes the cavalry. He's formed a coalition with another nomadic male, one who is also in terrible condition. But his presence is enough to turn the tide. <laughs> After a brief but desperate battle, the lions drive off the hyenas and then exact a grisly revenge. In the aftermath, Farai has taken a hyena cub. Hyenas are relatively slow breeders, and the death of a single cub can be an enormous loss. Farai seems almost too weak and exhausted to eat the cub. It's most unusual for a lion to eat a hyena, but Farai was obviously really desperate and starving. Still, the Richardsons hold out some... It was this tiny little thing that wasn't going to have much of a chance. Out on its own. the infrared light illuminates a group of elephants who have come to the spring and appear to be acting strangely. They seem both attracted and repelled by something.
After searching through their monitors, the Richardsons discover the cause. It's the baby elephant, now dead. After having followed the baby Ellie for days and nights, we were amazed to see the other elephants pay their respects. It was very touching. It's difficult to know why they do it. Maybe it's just curiosity. Maybe there is some sort of feeling of loss within the elephants that they feel one of their number has gone. But there's no room for sentiment in nature. These are just the harsh realities of life at the spring. obviously really desperate and starving. Still, the Richardsons hold out some hope for the young lion. Given the fact that he'd survived through most of the dry season and he had formed a coalition with another male, he'd obviously hung in this long and we just hoped that he'd manage to hang in a bit longer. The next morning, Phil and trackers Chris Cross and Mike head out in the already soaring temperatures, strategizing where best to capture a hunt on film. If we go down, if we go down, too bad, bad, a bad route, bad, bad, go down to the water. Some of the pride watches them pass by. A few yards further on, warning grumbles emanate from a thicket. It's the dark-maned male. He is still not fully habituated to the filmmakers. But soon the lions have lost interest in them. Something more pressing has their attention. Oh, there she is. Phil hustles to get a small lipstick camera in place so that he and Lynn can monitor the den remotely and maybe catch the mother and cubs together. Okay, let's see what's clear out here. The lipstick's ready. Then it's time to go. Fifty yards downwind from the den, Phil keeps an eye on the cubs, awaiting Shumba's arrival. is in the den. She seemed so proud when she came back and we watched her through the remote camera for quite a few weeks and she was fantastic with the cubs. She was so gentle and we, we thought she was to be a good mommy. It's been the perfect ending to the Richardson's time walking with lions. After four difficult years, they've captured the most intimate moments of an entire generation. Held in one position, the ones is on the ground, he's got no chance. It will take the pride 20 minutes to kill the enormous beast. Shumba has truly proved to be Mrs. Hunter's daughter. Fearless at the kill. In the ensuing few weeks, it becomes clear that Shumba is up to something. The lions often used to lie up in the dry riverbed. But we noticed that Shumba was always there, and quite often on her own. So we suspected that she wasn't just lying up for comfort, but that something else was cooking. Chris Cross and Mike keep an eye on Shumba, waiting for her to head out on a hunting excursion. 
Only then can they safely send in the filmmakers to find out exactly what's been keeping Shumba so preoccupied. Cameras in hand, Lynn and Phil head for the spot that Shumba has been visiting. There, in a thicket that seems inadequate to protect something so precious, they find themselves in Shumba's den. I was obviously really desperate and starving. Still, the Richardsons hold out some hope for the young lion. Given the fact that he'd survived through most of the dry season and he had formed a coalition with another male, he'd obviously hung in this long and we just hoped that he'd manage to hang in a bit longer. The next morning, Phil and trackers Chris Cross and Mike head out in the already soaring temperatures, strategizing where best to capture a hunt on film. If we go down, if we go down, too bad, bad, a bad route, bad, bad. Go down to the water. Some of the pride watches them pass by. A few yards further on, warning grumbles emanate from a thicket. It's the dark-maned male. He is still not fully habituated to the filmmakers. But soon the lions have lost interest in them. Something more pressing has their attention. Oh, yeah. oh there she is. Ten degrees. With trackers Vice and Chris, Lynn follows a fresh trail. This is fresh now. Fresh, what time? Yeah, this is uh, six o'clock. Okay, this is the one we must stay on now, Vice. Okay, let's follow this one. The lions have gotten used to the filmmakers and usually ignore them, but today, for some reason, they are not welcome. charges you it's the most terrifying feeling as if your heart has dropped out of your body at times I thought well this is it and it's coming too close what do I do but thank goodness our trackers taught us not to move and that was our saving grace. Sorry, Shumba. Very sorry. I think speaking to them very... Now the ravenous cubs appear and suckle furiously. Even Farai, now old enough to be weaned, steals a suckle. Eventually, the females decide that enough is enough. Now, everyone is full and sleepy. rumble of thunder interrupts the lion's reverie. This calm, balmy night is about to take a violent turn. Humidity blown in from the north heralds the end of the long, hot, dry season. It's time to get Shumba and her cousins into the den. The filmmakers, too, head for cover, hoping that they were in a half, aside from occasional sightings of the pride. I 
Having hung in, we managed to see the pride from time to time. We caught glimpses of Farai and Shumba, and they all seemed to be flourishing. of mostly lost filming, the weather turns and the landscape begins to dry out again. Anxiously, Phil and Lynn await the return of the pride. Then one day they spot a familiar figure at the bottom of the gorge. It is Mrs. Hunter on a buffalo kill. After so much time, the filmmakers have no idea if the lions will remember them or if they'll be starting from scratch. We were very pleasantly surprised. She was actually amazingly tolerant, given the fact that we hadn't been this close to her for over 18 months. It was just so good to see the lions back again and to be on foot with them again. That feeling of being alive reawakened in us. To feel so at one with the lions. She hangs on to the thrashing one-ton animal, keeping out of reach of sharp hooves and horns. Finally, the rest of the pride arrives. It will take the combined weight and strength of all the lions to finish the buffalo off. the scavengers have settled in to observe the kill as have the filmmakers they don't make a kill every day and so when they do eat they make the most of it and they really gorge themselves and can eat 40 pounds of meat at a sitting spotted hyenas join the vultures waiting for a place at the banquet the lions are so full that their attempts to drive off the hyenas, their ancient enemies, are half-hearted at best. The young males are in their prime. Shumba and Farai, sensing trouble, head for cover. Kavingo has a choice to make, stand his ground or leave. The new males insolently sent Mark over Kavingo's marks, and the older lionesses seem intrigued. <laughs> Like most young males, these two were expelled from their birth prides at about Farai's age and have wandered after the herds ever since. But now they have their eyes on Kavingo's lionesses and his bountiful place at the spring. Kavingo, outnumbered, is still reluctant to give up his territory. But one of the new males takes the offensive. The battle is brief but decisive. The lionesses look on as Kavingo departs. He's so well and we liked him. I was really sad to see Kavingo go. Not only because we knew we'd never see him again, but because we got so attached to him. He was a very composed lion and very patient with his cubs. It was really sad to see him leave. The arrival of the two new males seems to have unnerved the pride. Young Shumba and Farai take to the trees in terror. 
arise approaching the age when young males are driven from the pride. With tolerant Kavingo gone, his situation is precarious. The filmmakers are unnerved as well. These lions came from nowhere. We'd never seen them before. They'd probably not laid their eyes on humans before. They kept running away when we went close to them. Hoping the lions will come to them, Phil and Lynn set up in a hide near the pride's favorite place to drink. They don't have to wait long. It's the larger of the new males, loudly roaring his claim to this territory. 